evening. How do we know when the behaviour of those holding high office crosses the line? It may sound obvious, but for some it's increasingly hard to see. Today, Labour called for an investigation into the former Prime Minister David Cameron. After allegations, he lobbied the Chancellor to save a company in which he had investments. Against that backdrop, yesterday, the Prime Minister's spokesperson said Boris Johnson acted with honesty and integrity over an alleged affair with Jennifer Arcuri that involved taxpayer funding when he was Mayor of London. Last year, the Home Secretary Priti Patel was found by an independent inquiry to have broken the ministerial code by bullying staff. The Prime Minister rejected those findings. A six-figure payout was made to the civil servant who accused her, and she remains in post. The government insists the highest standards were demonstrated in each of these cases. But some will say it all feels a long way from the days when those in elected office resigned to restore public trust. So have the rules changed? Have we changed? Or is the system breaking? Here's Nick Watt. Symbols of high standards of nobility and courage. Symbols inspiring generations of leaders keen to follow in the footsteps of giants of history. But do today's leaders meet the standards meant to govern our public life? A blast from the not too distant past, finding himself back in the present over current business links with a financier forged during his time in number 10. Labour is calling for an investigation after it emerged that Lex Greensill was given a Downing Street business card. The government says his appointment was approved in the normal way. And questions too over whether Boris Johnson was transparent about his friendship with a US tech entrepreneur when he was Mayor of London. Jennifer Arcuri travelled on City Hall trade trips while they were having what she has described as an affair. You like hanging out with us, right? I do. I do. I'm always happy to hang out at InnoTech. One set of principles is meant to guide standards in public life for all office holders. The Nolan principles say they should show selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. Right, I think we can now say we're very nearly there. The principles were drawn up in the mid-1990s as John Major's government battled allegations of sleaze. We must go back to basics. We want our children to be taught the best. High standards pledged by an aspiring Prime Minister who now finds himself under fire after lobbying former colleagues now in government. There is, I believe, another big issue that we can no longer ignore. It's the next big scandal waiting to happen. It's an issue that, frankly, crosses party lines and has tainted our politics for too long. It's an issue that exposes the far too cosy relationship between politics, government, business and money. While some might expect a lifelong personal adherence to the principles of public life, they technically no longer apply to David Cameron, who is a private citizen. The principles did apply to Boris Johnson in his time as mayor. The Independent Office for Police Conduct found no evidence that he had sought to play an active part in influencing Jennifer Arcuri's presence on trade missions, though it did say he should have declared an interest. The Greater London Assembly is carrying out an investigation. Number 10 insists the Prime Minister has acted at all times with integrity. Britain prides itself on a relatively clean public life, compared with some of our near neighbours. No Nicolas Sarkozy over here facing the threat of jail. But there are times when mammon meets politics, raising questions about whether we're quite as clean as we think we are. Well, if you go through the Nolan principles, I would say on all seven, he fails regularly. I would say on all seven, government ministers fail regularly. And what I find scary, actually, is that nobody really seems to care very much. And I just think that this is this sort of, you know, Trumpian descent into a politics where standards that were there for a reason are being deliberately debased and eroded. But don't all governments get into trouble in this area? I mean, your government, the Tony Blair <laughs> government, took a million pounds from Bernie Eccleston, didn't want to declare it. 
and went ahead with what he wanted, which was to exempt Formula One from uh, the tobacco advertising ban. Look, you go through every government, you'll find scandals. What I find extraordinary about this government is that nobody seems to view them as scandals. A Whitehall observer believes Boris Johnson and David Cameron may have questions to answer, but the principles of public life are working. I think there are now seven principles of, of public life, as they're called, the Nolan principles, which have been with us for more than 20 years. And I think, by and large, those do work. In fact, you could argue that they're working better. We're in a, a time of enormous scrutiny, real blowtorch of public attention, and that has downsides in some way. We're not here to discuss the council culture and all that. But that does have the advantage that people really are looking very, very hard at uh, those who govern us. A new season beckons, but a return of the old theme of the troubled relationship between power, money and friendship. Well, that was Nick Watt, and he's with me now. That was a broad look at the, the principles of public life there, Nick. Um, specifically this evening, what are we learning? What are we hearing? Yes, so the Labour Party is calling for an investigation into David Cameron after they uncovered a business card that you saw featured in my film that showed that that financier, Lex Greensill, was given the position of senior advisor in the Prime Minister's office. Now, at one level, this is not surprising. Uh, Lord Hayward, the late Cabinet Secretary, who knew Lex Greensill from the city, he was keen to bring him in. They wanted business expertise. It was a time of austerity, but a time when they wanted to help business. And he had come up with this vehicle to help businesses uh, who find that they get paid late by government agencies, uh, for example, uh, the NHS. Uh, the problem for David Cameron, and this has been shown in an FT investigation, is that two years after leaving Downing Street, he went to work for Lex, Gra Lex Grain Grainsill. Uh, that's fine. He didn't need to declare that. It was two years after he left, but that business is now in trouble. Um, so no rules appear to have been broken and there is confidence in the David uh, Cameron camp. They're saying that the the lobbying regulator uh, made made clear that they weren't going to investigate it. On the Committee of Standards in Public Life, they believe, is not going to investigate this. But I do have to say, I do not sense an outpouring of love for David Cameron in the Conservative Party and talking, hearing from people who were in government with him, they say this is really not helping his reputation. Nick, thanks very much indeed. Well, joining us now, Sir Vince Cable, former business secretary, Sir Charles Walker, former chair of the House of Commons Procedure Committee, and Professor Liz David Barrett, the director of the Centre for the Study of Corruption at Sussex University, who just last week gave evidence to the Standards in Public Life Committee. Um, and welcome to you all. Uh, Vince Cable, if I can start with you, uh, can I just ask you what your response is to what you've read and heard about that time uh, when, when David Cameron was Prime Minister and, and you were in his cabinet as business secretary. Was this a surprise to you? Um, well, I, I never heard of Alex, Alex Greenhill until recently. But I, mean, I think the two things that are thrown up by uh, the David Cameron affair, and I'm, you know, he's not done anything wrong, as far as we know, uh, is that two of the big weaknesses of the rules. I mean, one is in the, the lobbying legislation, which was put through in 2014. We, we Liberal Democrats in the coalition thought it was too weak and criticised it. It was also criticised in Parliament. And one of the weaknesses being exposed, that if you're an employee of a, of a company that is lobbying government, as opposed to a self-declared lobbyist, um, you, you know, you don't have to declare anything, so that the register is is worthless in those circumstances. And the other is that the committee, uh, which advises on uh, business activities to stop the revolving door, it has this sort of blanket two-year rule, which is fine, and, and that makes, makes sense if you're a, talking about, a, say, a junior minister and, and a relatively minor business activity. But if you're talking about a senior member of the government, a member of the cabinet, let alone the prime minister and a major um, corporate involvement, the, the same rules apply. And, you know, arguably we should be talking about much longer periods of exclusion, uh, if necessary, lifetimes. So, I mean, the, 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 there are sort of weaknesses in the structure which have been shown up and need to be dealt with. So just in terms of, of the structure and the rules, um, I mean, when, when, he, when he lobbied the chancellor on behalf of... of of the government. What, did he break any rules there? I mean, was there anything that he, he crossed? There was no line that he crossed, actually, was there? It, it, exactly. I mean, uh, as far as we can see, it behaved perfectly properly and that the rules were weak. 
the, the problem about the lobbying legislation is we knew they were weak and they were deliberately diluted um, when the legislation went through Parliament when it was discussed in government. And that is reprehensible. Um, but that was, um, you know, some years ago. And it, we didn't know that David Cameron himself would get involved in all this. Let me turn to Liz David Barrett, because uh, the, the point that Alistair Campbell was making in Nick's piece was that all governments have scandals. We know that there are oh, scandals or, you know, moments for every government. But his point was that nobody seems to count them as scandals anymore. Um, Liz, what is your reading of, of whether any rules are actually being broken here? I think that we need to look at it perhaps not in terms of breaking rules, but in terms of uh, declining standards. So you, you mentioned in the piece the, the Nolan principles that we have. Um, actually, these set really strong principles for how people in public life should behave. And I think we see that those are just not being upheld. Uh, to take a few areas, uh, if you look at uh, appointments to key public offices, they used to be absolutely on the basis of merit. And we see more and more political appointments now. Uh, people who are appointed on that basis just for loyalty are less likely to be good at the job and they're less likely to ask questions. Um, you know, we also see, I think, an unwillingness to submit to external scrutiny to put up a minister on major news programmes such as your own uh, or to you know, publish transparent uh, information about what the government's doing. And you know, finally, I think there's a big problem with these internal investigations. So when there is evidence that something has gone wrong or the allegations that it has, we really need to investigate. And that's absolutely critical for public confidence. Um, Charles Walker, can I turn to you on that? And we're very happy to have you as a representative of the Conservative Party as well, obviously, as, as a former chair of the House of Commons Procedure Committee. But the ultimate arbiter of the ministerial code is the Prime Minister. Are you happy with the way it is being arbitrated? Well, I think David Cameron, well, I don't think I know, David Cameron left office before he was 50, I think five years ago. It, it would be ridiculous to suggest that a former prime minister can't have a life after serving as prime minister or a life before is serving as prime minister. And I'm not apologist, an apologist for serving prime ministers, but, but I do think in the case of David Cameron, he's left office and he is entitled to, to, to earn a living. I don't think anyone was suggesting that he shouldn't have a life either before or after. But the, the points you heard um, Liz make just then was that this is now a government where appointments are made on loyalty, not merit, um, where there is a lack of, of willingness to have public scrutiny and uh, internal investigations are quite often thrown to one side. Now, as, as a Conservative, do you, do you not worry that sort of Conservative values are, are just being sort of thrown down the stream? Well, look, I'm really pleased we have a free media and a media that likes to interrogate politicians, prime ministers and ministers, and that's your role. Uh, the fact of the matter is we're discussing this tonight. It's been discussed in newspapers. It's been discussed on multiple news outlets. Um, and as I think uh, David Cameron used to say, sunshine is the best disinfectant. So I, I, I'm, I'm greatly reassured that when things are uncovered, that people think there might be a problem with those things. They get aired, discussed uh, and, and debated. And that's the role of a free and open press where people are hold, hold, held to account. So, it, it, Liz, it just comes back to the role of the press, I guess, that as long as we're asking the questions, then it, it doesn't really matter if, if the internal rules or, or, or the principles, the Nolan principles, aren't being upheld? I don't think um, that really holds, actually, because you know what you really need for accountability is not just that you expose things, but that there is, a, if there is a problem, it's investigated and then some kind of action is taken, and that's what sends the message that it's not okay to behave in that way. So I think you know the press is a free press is really important, but we also need people who are listening, who are then going to take action. Um, Vince Cable, do you think that there is still the power to investigate wrongdoing with this government? I mean, you talked about um, a, a failure to, to make the lobbying rules, the rules against lobbying, tighter, a bit more waterproof. Do you still have faith that, that scandals, I'm using that word generically, are being investigated and, and there is accountability? No, I don't. And I think there is a big gap. Um, it follows the resignation of Alex Allen, who was the 
independent uh, advisor to the Prime Minister on standards. That was over the Priti Patel affair. And as a result of that, um, the, the Prime Minister is not at the moment submitting any returns uh, as he's supposed to do half yearly on financial transactions involving ministers. Uh, there was also a system under David Cameron and Theresa May where every quarter uh, meetings with donors were declared. That, 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 as I understand it, that's not happening. And it's because there isn't this independent person at the centre uh, to demand to see the, the proper accountability. I mean, there is a much bigger picture here. I mean, Transparency International, which is the, the sort of benchmarking body internationally, has Britain ranked about 12th in terms of honesty. I mean, we're obviously we're ahead of many countries, but uh, far below the Scandinavians, the New Zealanders or other, they have a much more uh, honest system, uh, much less exposed to corruption. We have these glaring problems at the moment, you know, the nominations of the House of Lords, which are, you know, the appalling scandal and you know, are not being dealt with. So, yeah, we have major things to do to get Britain to be top of the class in terms of honesty in public life, which is where we sh should be. Charles, well, why doesn't that worry you, um, that, that lack of transparency that, that Vince is talking about, that failure to sort of fill in the financial forms or, or the way appointments are being made? Why, why wouldn't that worry you? I mean, lots of things worry me. Um, my understanding is, though, that the issues that you're discussing tonight have been investigated, and they were fully investigated. Uh, and there's a difference between an investigation not getting the result that you want as an observer and an investigation. Now, these investigations may not have yielded the results your other panellists wanted, but they were investigated. But I'm absolutely in favour of politicians and ministers and prime ministers and secretaries of state being held to account. OK, but just, just um, go back to that point. And the best way of doing that, and the best way of doing that is on the floor of the House of Commons. So as, as soon as we return to Parliament in full, as opposed to having Zoom, Zoom questions of ministers, yeah. I suspect that accountability will increase dramatically. The Prime I, Minister I just, will face yeah, the just, Leader of the Opposition across the dispatch box <laughs> in a full House of Commons. Well, hopefully we'll see it there too. But I want to go back to the point that Vince Cable was making, which was particularly about Alex Allen, who, as you know, was an independent advisor who ruled that the Home Secretary, uh, he said, had, not, had cons not consistently met the high standards required by the Ministerial Code of treating her civil servants with consideration and respect. He said the conclusion needs to be seen in context context and he said that there was no evidence that she was aware of the impact of her behaviour. But he found that she had not met the high standards. Essentially, he accused her, described as bullying, in terms of the impact felt by individuals. Now, you know what happened as a result of that, that, that the Prime Minister overruled him because he decides mm. that Priti Patel hadn't broken the ministerial code, and then it's Alex Allen that ends up resigning. Uh, uh, and... and, and the Prime Minister did overrule the findings. Uh, Pretty Patel apologised, but that is why the Prime Minister needs to be needs to be held to account for that decision. And he should be held to account. He should be held to account by you in the media, on the floor of the House of Commons. But the point we that Liz is making democracy. is that he's not. There, there, he, he, but but he's... there is there is there is no rule that says the Prime Minister has to up, uphold a finding. He doesn't have to uphold a finding. But the fact of the matter is, in not upholding that finding, it is incumbent on the Prime Minister to account for his actions and the reason why he has not upheld it. And again, I, I, I think we're sort of trying to find an, an area of disagreement where it perhaps doesn't exist. The important thing is, is when Prime Ministers make decisions, they are held to account for those decisions and thoroughly scrutinised. Well, if they can be scrutinised, which was the point that Liz David Barrett was making. So two but I points... want to see them scrutinised. OK. I want to see them. So, so Liz David Barrett, is that scrutiny happening, A, and is the answer to it, as Charles suggested, that actually it happens on the floor of the Commons or it happens fundamentally through the democratic system? Is that what we're saying now, that a big majority gets to do what it wants? So I think it's not really happening. I think you know, we've got a lot of institutions um, that are trying to regulate standards in public life, which are 
based on norms, trusting people to do the right thing and giving advice um, over what should be done. And increasingly, it seems advice is taken as, well, can be ignored. So I think we need to make those institutions a bit tougher. The independent advisor on ministerial interests, for example, would really need the power to in initiate their own investigations, I think. Um, and as for the, the democratic process, you know, we know that in this country, many, many seats are, are, are safe seats. And so that democratic check on power from elections, it just doesn't work that well. Um, it's also you know, only one check every five years. It's, it's really not enough for this kind of more nuanced uh, feedback on, on standards that we would need, I think. OK, thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for joining us this evening. Now, whatever you saw.